26, 2019, Wayne County Board of Commissioners meeting. That's Mr. Wayne Acott for invocation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's very heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to meet as leaders of Wayne County to make the decisions that infects everyone that lives in Wayne County. And pray for your guidance that we make the right decisions. Also, we want to remember our men and women in uniform, especially the ones that are deployed. We do live in a military community, and we have other military installations in Wayne County, other than Seymour Johnson. We want to remember all of our men and women in uniform, regardless of what branch of the service they serve in. Also, we want you to be with our first responders. Uh, we have different agencies in the county that are classified as first responders. Uh, they put our, their self in danger every day to protect us and the citizens of Wayne County. And we certainly want to be with them. Also, be with our leaders in Raleigh, that they make the right decisions for the state of Wayne, uh, North Carolina. And we especially want to be with the leaders of our great nation in Raleigh, I mean in uh, Washington, that makes the decision for the whole country. Uh, they're at odds sometimes, but the goal should be to do what is right for this great nation. We also want to be with the families that's been involved in the tra tragic shootings in Texas, Ohio, and other sections of, the, of this great country. We don't understand why, but we need to be with the families that are suffering from loss of loved ones. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, can I have a motion for the approval of minutes of the July 16, 2019 meeting? Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion to approve. Any discussions? All in favor, please say five, raise your right hand. Thank you. Discussion, adjustment agenda, Mr. Honeycutt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'd like to, uh, with respect to the consent agenda on number four, change motion to establish a public, a board of adjustment public hearing from September 3rd, move that to September 17th. Uh, also, number six, we would like to add uh, the cancellation of board commissioners meeting on September 3rd. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Before we leave that, and I don't want to be inappropriate, but I would like to have number six pulled for discussion. Okay. Cancellation of that meeting. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I uh, ask that we pull uh, budget amendment number 63. Um, I was informed by council we could not discuss that in closed session, so, uh, but I am asking that that be placed back on the consent agenda. Okay. 63 is placed back on, and number six will be discussed under in new, new business. business. Yes. Okay. Number three under new business. Yes, sir. We do have a, a couple of things we are adding under new business as well. Uh, number one is a proclamation honoring the National Honey Bee Day, uh, that we will read that proclamation. And the number two is the recommendation from the Facilities Committee to look at a jail study. Okay. Is there any board member that has anything you'd like to add? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I have a uh, item that I would like to add, not on the agenda, but at the end of the meeting, I would like to discuss it with the rest of the commission. Okay. All right. 
And also, I did want to mention that, as the board is aware, at the end of our closed session, we will be taking a tour of our new renovated probation building, uh, which is the old Farm Bureau building. So uh, this public is invited, but the board will be touring that at the conclusion uh, of our closed session, and we will adjourn from there. Okay. And now we have a special presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Raymond Smith, who has a very, very special presentation uh, to present to one of our own. Pressure's on, Representative Smith. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as always, it is indeed a pleasure and an honor to address our county fathers. And thank you so much for everything that you do each and every day. Um, believe me, I know it's not easy. The uh, presentation of the Longleaf Order of the Pine to Ms. Geraldine Lee. Ms. Lee? And her family. Uh, is here with us today, and I don't know the proper protocol, but do they stand or will they be required to sit for television purposes? I, I believe I'd ask Ms. Lee that question. It's up to you, Ms. Lee. They can stand for a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the family Thank of Ms. You. Lee, please stand. Thank you. My husband, Kenneth, <clears throat> my daughter, Kristen, my daughter, Kara, my granddaughter, Kadir, my son-in-law, right behind you. My grandson, Kadir, <laughs> my son-in-law, Nancy, and uh, there are a lot of other people here whom I consider family, and I'm glad they're here. Thank you. Miss Lee, do you consider your cousins family? And then cousins, <laughs> listen, my cousin Kendall, <laughs> and my cousin Bill. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, folks, private joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Goes way back. <laughs> well, as anyone who is a uh, <coughs> A student of our great state of North Carolina knows that the Order of the Longleaf Pine is absolutely the highest honor that any citizen of the state of North Carolina can receive. Now, it is my understanding that you're not native to North Carolina. I am not. So that is a double pleasure to know that we have someone who's not native to North Carolina who has come to North Carolina and embraced North Carolina as you have. And thank you for what you do. I will read uh, briefly a little bit of about uh, Miss Lee. She's she she's an extraordinary woman, absolutely. Uh, Thirty-seven years, I understand, in a in in a, in a previous that's right profession. Come to Wayne County and extend another uh, five years of your life. That is phenomenal, and probably the most phenomenal thing that I. I've read about you as you were, you graduated summa cum laude from our University of Mount Olive. Have you ever come close to that, Joe? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and we, me and you think we know some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, without any further ado, I would like to present the Order of Longleaf Pine, and it reads, State of North Carolina, Roy Cooper, Governor reposing special confidence in the integrity, learning, and zeal of Geraldine James Lee. I do, by these presents, confer the order of the Longleaf Pine with the rank of ambassador extraordinarily privileged to enjoy fully all rights granted to members of this exalted order, among which is the special privilege to repose the following North Carolina toast in select company anywhere in the free world. Here's to the land of the longleaf pine, the summer land where the sun doth shine, where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great. Here's to down home, the old North State. Signed, Governor Roy Cooper, this day, 16 July, 2019. Thank you so much. Thank you. keep it brief as I do first thanks to Craig and Chip for for hosting this I appreciate it 
I am humbled and grateful to be inducted into the Order of the Longleaf Pine. I'm extremely fortunate to have been nominated for this award by four people whom I highly respect, George Wood, Tommy Burns, Sheriff Larry Pierce, and Ginger Moore, my former assistant and one of the best HR directors this county will ever have. And I treasure the friendship and support over the last 30 or 40 years from Borden Parker, who is responsible for my place in Wayne County government history. Do I thank you or slap you? <laughs> <laughs> the good Lord has blessed me to survive 42 years in human resources, 37 years combined with Texas and Unifers, and five years with Wayne County. And he blessed me with a fine family, Kenneth, Kimberly, Kristen, and Kara, who tolerated my many days away from home and long nights at the office. And I can never repay them for that sacrifice. Wayne County is blessed with great employees and caring managers and commissioners, and I count each and every one of you as my friends. And lastly, thank you, Representative Smith, for your work in bringing my name to the attention of Governor Cooper. This award is truly appreciated and truly treasured. Thank you very much. Now we'll get to our public comments. Do anyone from the audience like to speak before this board this morning? Somebody that can sit with my son. My son has white wrists, and that's why I came right up here. Um, Toy tractor. I mean, I know we got a lot of shares out there. I just want to make sure we don't. I'll stop right while I'm on to see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, thank you. Um, I normally would not have my children with me, um, but a lot's going on in our family right now and sickness and things like that. And um, my mother in law is getting an infusion this morning, and she's kind of one of the only people I trust with both of my autistic sons. Um, I wanted to say thank you, Ms. Um, Commissioner Camardi, for coming out to the um, town hall meeting um, that was two weeks ago. I really felt like you um, represented the commissioners very well, and I really appreciate you coming out to that meeting and speaking before everyone. Um, I was really concerned about the last article last week about Edgewood. Um, I really appreciate you all taking the time to take a tour of Meadow Lane and Edgewood. Um, I was really concerned about what um, board member Chris West said. Um, he said it wouldn't hurt us to bring each other up to date on what's going on rather than hearing it from a group of angry people out here or a group out there that doesn't have actual facts. I'm not sure if he's talking about a group of angry people as the special needs moms and families from Edgewood that are fighting for a new Edgewood and are contacting legislators in hopes of, of getting a new Edgewood. But I really hope that, that no one really speaks of, of special needs parents like that um, because they're just doing um, what, what any parent would do um, when fighting for the rights of their children. Um, I really appreciate um, Commissioner um, Daughtry and Commissioner Kamadri for their um, comments in that article expressing um, wanting to have more meetings with the Board of Education. And um, I would also like to really advocate for meetings with our city manager and our mayor. Um, I met with them last week and they had no idea what was going on with Edgewood. Um, the mayor had only heard things from Board of Education members but just didn't really know what was going on. So I updated them and I'm hoping that possibly the city can inv get involved with helping Edgewood. I don't know if there's funds that could be used, um, but I did make them aware and I hope that, that something can be done regarding that. Um, an Edgewood parent would have been here today to speak, but her son is sick. Um, so I hope I can um, kind of represent her. Um, I have a nine-year-old son sitting here, my son Sydney, and he has autism. I'm sorry, you're gonna be nine tomorrow though, right? Tomorrow's your birthday. Um, um, but her son is in a wheelchair and he has seizures and he has to wear a helmet to keep himself safe and he doesn't walk very well. He has to have help w with walking and that's part of the reason that she's choosing Edgewood instead of Meadow Lane um, and, and to have the same supports that he had before and the equipment he had before and, and things like that. She and I live totally different lives and um, while I'm sitting here in sneakers just hoping and praying my kids don't run out the door, um, she's hoping and praying her son doesn't have a seizure or that her child's not mistreated at school or just anything like that. 
that, and that's that's one of the reasons she's choosing choosing Edgewood because that's her safe place, that's her safe school. Um, I wanted to make sure that that it was. I brought it up in front of the Board of Education about training for the teachers at Edge, at um, Meadow Lane if Edgewood students are going to be there. Um, I think it's really important for the regular ed teachers to be trained and to know how to help these students, especially flight risk students like my children that run out of the room and could potentially run into a typically developing classroom. Um, I'm just I'm just really worried about the whole Meadow Lane move and everything, and I and I, I really want a new school school for Edgewood. So I keep advocating. I, I've messaged um, David Rouser. I I, I just keep bugging people and I'm hoping to bring the finances to Wayne County so we can do everything we want to do so we can help Rosewood schools so we can help the other schools in the district and um, I just wanted to thank you for all that you all do and I wanted to know if you heard anything about the lead inspection um, two weeks ago at a Board of Education meeting they said the lead inspection was going to happen the next day and it didn't happen and then they, they said it was going to happen last week and I haven't heard anything about if it happened and I've emailed Ken Durskin and I haven't heard anything back and he's the public relations for the Board of Education so I wanted to know if y'all had any updates on Edgewood. And again, I appreciate all that you do. Thank you so much. Does anyone else wish to speak? If not, public comments time is closed. Okay, and report to me, Commissioner Acock. Oh, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I need to mention something before the consent agenda okay. is approved. I'm sorry. <clears throat> yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, we do have some reappointments. Uh, Madam Clerk, you may have to help me with some of these names, but I'm going to give it a stab. All right. Uh, the reappointments for Latino Council, Esteban Guzman, Denora Keith. Is that Myra? Maria. Maria. Marquin. Marquin. And Luis. Luis Cruz. Uh, and they are reappointments to Latino Council. And that's in form of a motion. Heard motion discussion on the motion. If not, all in favor, please see if I raise your right hand. All right, uh, jury commission, uh, reappointment, Ms. Barbara Acock, Ms. Form of a motion. Heard the motion. All in favor, please signify, raise your right hand. Adult Care Home Community Advisory Committee, Joyce O'Hanley, and that's a reappointment, in the form of a motion. You hear the motion, any discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor, please signify, raise your right hand. Uh, Another reappointment of counseling on aging. Uh, Rosalind Burke, that's the form of a motion. Any discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor, please see if I raise your right hand. And uh, last, Mr. Chairman, Public Library Board of Advisors, Mr. Johnny Pippin, that's the form of a motion. Heard the motion, any discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor, please see if I raise your right hand. And that's all we have today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Get, you have to add. I, I do. Uh, there was a question with respect to the Belfast contract, the lease. Uh, we did have Safka back in check. Uh, it is a not a month to month lease. It is six months, uh, uh, but six months to six months with 45 day uh, notification for wanting to cancel the contract. So I wanted you to make sure you had the full information. I'm sorry, let me hear that again. The con the lease with Belfast is six months, so it's, it's not, you know, it's not month to month, it is six months with a 45-day cancellation. Okay. So I just want to make sure everybody had all the information up front. That's six months, two six months. Right. One year. Right. 45 days to cancel. Six months and then another six right. months, 45 days of right. cancellation. Okay. And that is the current lease? Yes. Okay. And we have voted to approve that today? No, well, that was the budget amendment. Yeah, that was the last, you're right. Previous lease. It was the previous lease. And we have voted to approve that today? The budget amendment to fund that, yes. Let me be sure I understand. You got six months, and you're going to roll into another one. Or? 
or can you go give a year notice 45 days it's before six months in? But you pay, it's six months to six months as opposed to month to month. So you're going to get a bill for $6,000 for the first six months and then $6,000 for the second six months. And it's if you don't want it after the first year, you have to give them 45 days. No. So it is really a year. It's a year. Really look yes. at. But, but the current lease has expired. Yes. There is, is no current. There is no current. And we have it on sort of a temporary basis because you have other plans to house this piece of equipment. The, what we basically were doing were, was there was a concern about the location of the QRV. Originally, the plan was to keep it at the Nahana Station, our new Nahana Station, instead of Belfast. And there was concern about the location that it was too far away. We've had some concerns from our medical director, and they've asked that it be relocated back to Belfast. More to the center of the county. Is that what we're talking to, about? Right. It, it, to, uh, for better coverage, yes, sir. And how many of those do we have? We have two QRVs. Where's the other one located? Uh, South Dudley. South, South, South River. South End. Right. So the original thought was to have, have it up in the north land to take care of the far away? Right. The, the really the only change we were looking at is originally we we leased it with Belfast and we were trying to save funds by moving it to the county station in Nahana but Nahana is further uh, west and it was causing some concern with our medical uh, director as far as the call and response time so the discussion was to move it back to Belfast. Mr. Chairman. Yes. That's the reason I had to ask for it to be discussed later, but apparently my wishes are not being listened to. Thank you. So is it possible we need three of those? Because the reason I say that is, if Nahana is far away for folk in the center of the county, then in the center of the county is far away from the people in the home. As if I would just be concerned if there wasn't one located in the southern part of the county. Am I, well, I'm but still, we're we, still talking about location. We, we, we you know, the, this is just really for the QRVs, you know, I'm, which is a rapid response. But our location for our substations, you know, we have, uh, especially the central part of the county, very uh, well uh, stationed in place. You don't have a concern? Yeah. Was, um, was this the result of response time or number of calls? The number of calls have something to do with this? But originally, it was a dollars and figures decision to move it from Belfast to Nahana. It was a dollars and figures. It was dollars and cents. Uh -huh. It was trying to save $12,000. However, once we made that decision to move to Nahana, we started getting kickback saying that may have not have been the right decision because of the location. So the discussion and the recommendation was to move the QRV from Nahana back to Belfast. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask one more time. I've asked for this to be discussed later, and I would certainly appreciate the rest of the board uh, granting me my request. Uh, thank you. Did, did so we, this are we not able to discuss this in closed session, Mr. Parker? Uh, I have some other concerns, but I don't need to discuss them here. There is a way that it can be discussed in closed session. I agree with Mr. Acock. We need to we do discuss this otherwise. Should we pull it in? Yes. <coughs> We're gonna do that later. We can pull it from the consent agenda now. Yeah. We can pull it now again. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I make a motion we pull it and, and, and put it back and put it under new business or 
old business or whatever, pull it from consumption. Yes, form of a motion. All right, Commissioner Acock has made a motion to pull Budget Amendment 63. For further discussion at a later time, to be voted on at a later time. Is there any discussion or actually on that needs to be cleared up? Will it be placed on the new business or will that be determined later? I said no later. I need to determine later. Whatever council suggests. Motion's on the floor. Any further discussion? All in favor, please signify raise your right hand. Okay, so I reckon um, the rest consent agenda is okay for being reviewed at 8 a.m. <laughs> I'll make a motion. Uh, number, six, number six was pulled. Number six. Yeah, number six yeah. was pulled. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, I, I make a Can motion we that we approve that? the consent agenda. Okay. Well, just a minute. Uh, just for clarification, Mr. Chairman, I asked for it to be pulled, but I did not want to leave it. I want it to be pulled, but I want it to be discussed. It, it, it's under new uh, new business. All right, I just want to know where it was. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. motion made. All in favor, please sing five, raise your right hand. All right. Now, new business. And we'll start with the Honeybee Proclamation. We have a proclamation that we are requested to approve uh, the National Honeybee Day Proclamation. And if the board's agreeable, I'll be glad to read it. Whereas the honeybee is critical to the process of pollination with one bite of food and three benefiting directly from honeybee pollination and Honeybees are essential for production of more than 90 food crops and bee pollination is responsible for 15 billion in added crop value and whereas honeybees face a significant threat from colony collapse disorder, which has been linked with disease, pathogens, parasites, environmental stress, loss of natural habitat, and inappropriate use of pesticides, herbicides, among other factors. And whereas the honeybee works together with other bees in the bee colony as a single vibrant living organism that helps to maintain a healthy ecosystem. And whereas the United States Department of Agriculture is working in cooperation with federal agencies, universities, industries, and additional partners to find ways to improve honeybee health and habitat. Now, therefore, it be it resolved that the Wayne County Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim Saturday, August 17th, 2019, as National Honeybee Day in Wayne County and encourages the people in Wayne County to celebrate the honeybee and its many contributions with appropriate observances and activities adopted this the sixth day of August, 2019. Thank you. Motion to approve. <clears throat> yeah, Motion to approve. Okay. Motion made to approve proclamation. Any discussion? All in favor, please see five, raise your right hand. <coughs> next. Uh, next, I uh, would like to present a uh, recommendation from the facilities committee. Uh, the Wayne County Board of Commissioners Facility Committee met on July 31st to begin discussions at looking at a jail facility study. Uh, the study will begin looking at our current needs at our jail, along with looking at, at forecasting bed needs through 2040. Our original jail was built in 1994, and an average life expectancy of a jail is approximately 30 years. We really begin to look at our planning process now uh, as the building is beginning to show us age. Also, with the changes that are coming down, we're, we're housing a larger number of females 
uh, than the jail was originally designed for. There's some juvenile issues that are coming up that we will be required to house that may cost us in the future. So is a jail is not a quick fix process. It's not something that you can do just overnight. Uh, we wanted to start looking at the planning now, uh, specifically at the William Street location where the Kerry Winders jail is now. So really looking at a whole new complex. Uh, again, the cost was 29250 and then there's some travel uh, allowance that is included of $2,500. Um, and this is still being currently reviewed by council. Uh, however, I know that there may be some changes to the scope of work uh, that we may need to work on with Mosley and Associates. Any questions or concerns at this time? Yes. It is worth saying that you know when we built the facility out here on William Street, we did plan for uh, growth at some point, and so and we discussed it a little bit. I know there's some plans may have some dust on them somewhere, but we need to make sure we pull those out so we don't redo, yeah, redo, redo well. and spend money on something that we've already got. So I just yes, wanted sir. to bring that to the public's attention. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. you know I for one, hate studies, hate to have to spend taxpayer dollars for studies, but it's very clear with the change in the requirements of incarceration and how that has affected over the last 25, 28 years, how that has affected the county's cost of housing uh, uh, people in our jail. Uh, on top of that, uh, it, it was really amazing to me to hear that with the misdemeanor law that has changed, how that really affects the counties. Example, my understanding of changing it, they've raised the age of a misdemeanor to 18. That's right, of juveniles. But, and that's, that's good in one sense. However, I don't think there was a full analogy of the cost to the county by doing so. <clears throat> Furthermore, juveniles must be placed in a juvenile detention center that's approved by the state. You just can't put them in and house them anywhere and Wayne County does not have a juvenile detention center. So that means that our juveniles will have to be housed outside of our county. The estimated cost currently is $240 per day per inmate. Let that sink in, $240 a day. <clears throat> our, our currently, I uh, understand we have uh, 13 juveniles in Wayne County, but by changing the age, that number will explode. It'll more than double. If you only had 13 out of county at $240 a day, you're exceeding $1 million a year that will be borne by the county taxpayer. That means a million dollars less that we have for all of our services. If you doubled that from 13 to 26, <clears throat> which they are anticipating that it would do, you're looking at over $2 million. So this is serious. And we need to uh, uh, find some way to get some guidance from individuals that are knowledgeable in the current laws and to extrapolate that out for the future. So even though I hate to see the cost, it's something I think that is as much needed so that we can, uh, it can guide our decisions on what we need to do. <clears throat> There's additional problems though. <laughs> our female inmates have increased dramatically. 
Um, there are, <laughs> there are just a lot of issues here in regards to, to actually the, uh, our individual people that we are housing in our, in our jails. Um, so with that in mind, I, I think we would in fact have to do it. However, that said, I would ask that we modify the motion to approve that we renegotiate the scope of work uh, and the price of this to include what we actually do need. Okay. Mr. Yes. And I think back um, when this uh, juvenile age was changed by a legislature and my thoughts are is that at the time I don't remember, maybe you other commissioners might remember, did we or anyone let the legislative delegation know our opposition to this? Or was it because we didn't know that this was going to turn around and bite us the way it has? My question is this, if our legislatures and the state are sending these mandates down to us, and they have, I'm, in, I'm of the opinion that we need to pass a resolution sent back to the legislator asking them to find some funding for us because this is costing us money. We, we need to be more visual on what's coming down from the state. I don't remember us doing a resolution opposing this uh, from the commissioner standpoint. I don't even know if any of our legislative delegation uh, oppose this on behalf of Wayne County. So I'm just saying, we don't know how, we, and we discussed this earlier, we don't know how to project uh, how to build a jail because we can't predict what the state's going to do to change everything that we have in line and we're saying two, three, four years before we can start building a new jail, how, how much are the requirements from the state on us are gonna change in the next three to four years? And so, <coughs> Commissioner Daughter, you're 100% correct. We don't know. We're playing Russian roulette, basically. We're, we're playing Texas Hold'em, you know? When we are trying to project what the state's going to do. And so that's my concern. My concern is these dollars that, that Commissioner Daugherty is talking about are true. $240 a day. This is, this is true. This is not something that has been made up. And here we are, we're looking at other, we're looking at, we're looking at schools, we're looking at other departments in our county that need uh, buildings to move into. Uh, and we're sitting here wondering how we're going to fund all this. How we're going to do it. So that's my comments, Mr. Chairman. Chair. Thank you very much. I wanted to clarify one thing. I was eighteen dollars off. It's two twenty-four a day. I so I wanted to clarify, <laughs> I wanted to clarify that because uh, I misspoke. Though. It's two twenty-four a day. Uh, I do have a conference call with Mr. Billy Lasseter set up for 2 o'clock um, uh, Thursday. He is in charge of the juvenile and adult correctional facilities so that we can clarify some things. Right now, we, it is sort of a hit and miss as to what is going to be done with the juveniles, as you just stated. So I'm hoping to get some clarification, and I think some of this stuff is maybe still pending possibly on the uh, budget being passed as to what, what will happen. But that will, if uh, if any of you would like to sit in, Mr. Honeycutt, if you'd like to sit in Thursday at uh, two o'clock, I have that uh, set up with Mr. Billy Laster, hopefully to clarify some things for us because it is a guessing game right now for all of us. Sheriff. Yes, sir. And maybe I'm just dreaming this. It seemed like when we were, when we built this facility out here on William Street, there were dollars somewhere in the state for a juvenile facility. Would you ask to see if any of that money is still there? I, I did. I bring uh, that up? Or? I talked with Mr. Lasseter whenever we built the new facility, and because of the restrictions, he was going to come visit our yeah. annex, and it did not meet the qualifications that we had to have at that time. So I, that's another thing I wanted to ask him. What are the 
restrictions and the requirements that are going to be as we formulate a plan for this new facility if it's something that we can can build for uh, financially. Uh, to, well, I knew there was a discussion about it, but there it's been was. so long I can't really recall. And because the what the juveniles have to have and uh, for their educational purposes and everything, it did not meet what was needed uh, the way we had it designed. Yeah. Mr. Chair. I understand, I understand uh, that this has to be uh, a separate building, is that correct? It has to be out of sight, out of sound of any adults, and it has to have a classroom setting for educational purposes, is my current understanding. Those are the type of things that I really wanted to clarify with Mr. Lassiter when we have that conference call. Well, if that's true, we're talking about a separate building, if that's true. Or a, That's why I'm saying some the legislature threw this on us. We need to go back and ask and, and say, look, y'all need to give us some some money for brick and mortar to take care of this, because this is very costly to the county. And that's the, some of the things I want to clarify. What kind of expenses are going to be involved? Transportation of the facility. <coughs> Supposedly the state was going to take care of, but no one has been able to answer my question so far as to who was going to cover yeah. housing and transportation for these juveniles. Hopefully he can enlighten me more Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Okay, so motion is made by Commissioner Daugherty. All in favor, please signify, raise your right hand. Yep. We'll have that back at your next meeting. Thank Great. you. And number three, cancellation of the meeting. Uh, thank you for entertaining. Uh, let, give me a moment to entertain uh, something. But I need to give a little background before I make a motion. Uh, at a previous, at a night meeting that I was at, um, a young lady they referenced it was Raymond Smith. I was asked a question about night meetings. And at that time, I knew that we all had received at least a letter from the public, some public official, asking us to consider uh, scheduling night meetings. And I think that's maybe the way it was framed. And I know at that time there was probably some individual discussion. I don't remember that we, uh, I don't remember there being a formal discussion. It certainly was not anything voted on about a night meeting. But at that particular uh, meeting that I was at, a gentleman from uh, the New Hope Road area, and I specifically remember that, asked about the potential to have a night meeting. And uh, my answer to him was, uh, you might uh, contact our county manager to see what our status is because I knew, and based on my memory, we had not decided absolute on a particular night meeting. Uh, I think there was one member in the audience that said that she had received a letter from your office saying that we would not have any night meeting scheduled. Is that? How you the, the 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 consensus we we have talked about it and the consensus at the time was not to hold night meetings and however we can change well and that and I, I think maybe I'm not I'm not want to delve deep into the consensus but I know that one of my suggestions was that we have at least one per quarter now that we didn't get into a full discussion that was the way that I saw it. But I was a little bit, <laughs> I can't use the word blindsided, but I said to the gentleman, call our county manager and he'll be able to give you an answer. But someone did say they had received a letter. So that I knew at that point that the decision, whether by consensus uh, uh, or unilateral, it had been made. So this is, a, this is the, uh, the motion that I'm going to put on the floor is that instead of canceling the September 3rd meeting, that we take the opportunity to change that meeting to a a night meeting to give the public who is interested in a night meeting the opportunity to have a night meeting. Uh, and since we're canceling one in September, we wouldn't be adding one. We would just be moving it, and that uh, that might uh, kill two birds with one stone, as the old country boy like to say. 
so I, uh, if I'm not out of line, I would like to put a motion on the floor that we change that November 3rd meeting to another night. And this so smartphone had me on September, but now I can't find it. But could you help me out on a date that was potential that we could vote on? And I guess the motion would read, would say, uh, I propose that we have a night meeting first before we start trying to pick the date. If I'm not out of line. I'm at your will. I move that we have, I, I move that we have scheduled a night meeting in September. <clears throat> and I put that in the form of a motion. Uh, I'll wait for discussion. <laughs> you say something, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say something. If uh, that, that week of the third is probably out, and just keep in mind, if we would have to have it either the week of the night, but see our next regularly scheduled meeting is September 17th. So, you know, do you want to have a week or less between the night meeting <clears throat> and our regular scheduled meeting? That was that was my concern. If you have them too close together, um, are you really going to accomplish anything? Well, I will adjust my motion to say a night meeting and leave it open as to whether it had to be in September or not. But I, and I only picked September because we were taking one out of September. But I, I could adjust that to say, uh, uh, I put a motion on the floor, we have a night meeting. Uh, and the inference would be soon, sooner than later. Mr. Payne. And Mr. Uh, Mayo and Mr. Bell contested this in 2012, and I was actually running for office at that time. And there were attempts by the Board of Commissioners at that time to have night meetings and actually move them around the county. We did. They were poorly attended. Yes. They were poorly attended. In addition to that, you got to think and realize that this is not the only board that we serve on. Many of us serve on boards that we have night meetings, so it's... I just like flavor. I don't. You know, I understand why you're making the motion, but I just. Mr. Chair, I don't think it'll solve anything. Mr. Cock. Yes, sir. I mean, we tried two night meetings, and we had less turnout for the night meetings than we do the daytime meetings. I'm, I'm not <coughs> saying that someone wouldn't come, but well, you know, we've already tried this. I mean, since we've been on board, we had two night meetings. Hmm. Am I not correct? Yeah, but we did it for about six months, one time or more. And uh, it doesn't matter to me when we had a meeting. I mean, I'm going to show up either way. But I don't understand <coughs> what's the purpose of the night meeting. I mean, we tried it, and we would have one <coughs> or two people there at the night meeting, not like we have here now. Uh, whoever's requesting the meeting have not, I haven't heard as to why they want the night meeting. Did you do you know, Mr. Uh, I, from what I and I, I'll be very honest, and from my history, if you have night meetings, people will want morning meetings. If you have morning meetings, people will want night meetings. Mr. Hagan, yeah. Um, I can explain the letter. The letter that we responded to asking for night meetings. Um, in our response, we asked for them to give us proposed dates and we would set up several locations and we never heard back from the individual. So just to give you that information, sir. Well, my, uh, 
my call for to put a motion on the floor was to put it before this board in an official way about whether or not we would entertain having uh, night meetings or not. Now, uh, I look around in this room and probably with the exception of the newspaper and other people who are here working, uh, in an official capacity, we might have seven or eight people at this meeting. Uh, there's a likelihood that we might not have any more than that at a night meeting. Um, my concern was to bring it to this board in an official way that I was specifically asked in public, could we have a night meeting? And I said, I don't have a problem with it, but it's something that would have to be this. And if I didn't say it exactly like this, the inference was it was something that would have to be brought before our board. So uh, I just simply, uh, at this point, uh, call for a vote. You just vote it up or down. All right, Mr. Chairman. I've heard the motion discussion was made. Uh, all in favor, please signify, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Thank you. Now, um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'm sorry. Could, could, I, could I back up for a minute and say that <clears throat> would this be something that we can, this is a pretty quick vote here about uh, Commissioner Camardis motion. But can we actually get this back on for discussion at some point? In other words, that's what I was going to do. I, sh I should have done this, but I, it's all over with now. I was going to make an amendment to, to, to discuss this, you know, further because of our past experience, not because nobody wants to do it. It's just the past experience that we've had. But I still think we need to talk about it. What else do you want to discuss? The what? What else do you want to discuss? Well, I'm just ask it. I don't know. I, I I want to give every opportunity to every citizen to be able to attend. But I I remember some of the things that we talked about before, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, is that uh, if you have uh, hourly employees, for example. Uh, if they come to a night meeting, we're going to have to pay them overtime. Am I correct? That's a uh, note Allison just submitted. Uh, uh, she said, didn't know if it was worth mentioning, but night meetings probably cost coming to calls. Always had to come in, staff, security, facilities, others that are not exempt, we do have to pay overtime. Yeah, that's, that was one of the things I brought up before because of the poor attendance. So I know we had a meeting in the northern part of the county. And we had one in the southern part of the county, and it it was it just was not uh, well attended at all. So, okay, thank you. Let, let me also clarify as well. It was motion to cancel the September third meeting. Has that been? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I so move that we cancel our <laughs> September 3rd meeting. Any, any discussion on that motion? No, no, all in favor, please see if I raise your right hand. Any opposed? Um, Mr. Chairman, I do have a couple of comments and I do have one introduction I would like to make today. Uh, I'd like to introduce to the board Aaron Stryker. Uh, Aaron is our new uh, emergency management coordinator. Uh, Aaron started this week. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Acock, uh, Chip, and also Brian Taylor uh, for the work that they did in sitting on the interview board. We had some really good candidates, uh, but Aaron felt was a very good fit for us. Uh, Aaron is a eight-year United States Marine Corps veteran, sergeant in the, the Marine Corps. Aaron, if you want to say it. But also, uh, Aaron has a degree in Homeland Security from Campbell University with a concentration in emergency management. So he's going to be working uh, with Brian, and uh, we're very excited that Aaron's here, especially since it is now hurricane season. So we have put a lot of work on Aaron in the past couple of days, <coughs> and um, he has really hit the ground running. And uh, Commissioner Acott, did you want to? 
Uh, just, do you have anything you would like to say to the commissioners? Um, do, do, come up to the microphone, please. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, good morning, gentlemen. I would just like to say thank you for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to serve people of Wayne County. Um, I know I have a little bit of a, or a little bit of a lack of direct experience with emergency management, but I've had with my experience in the Marine Corps and my training, I've actually found that sometimes being the new guy coming in, start asking questions, um, actually has shown improvement for. So let's thank you again to Commissioner Aycock, Mr. Honeycutt, Mr. Crumpler, and uh, Fire Marshal Taylor for taking time out of their out of their schedules to give me this chance and thank you again to all of you. Will it be all right if I call you Sergeant Striker? <laughs> <laughs> I've been called I've been called a striker for so long. It was actually weird coming back home and hearing friends and family call me Aaron. I had to like, wait, are you talk, talk, talking to me? It's like <laughs> just because last name, but yeah, that's that's fine. I'll get my attention, sir. Okay. Uh, one thing you said yes, sir. was mentioned by someone reading it. That uh, you were, you have past experience with Homeland Security. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yes, sir. One of the duties that I actually had with the Marine Corps is I ran a 24-hour armed patrol for highly sensitive areas and some um, um, VIPs. So I was in charge of making sure the patrols were on duty and doing their jobs, as well as setting up um, react drills, active shooters, bomb threats, fire drills. So we were working on cordoning off areas and how to interact with not only other Marines, but we had a civilian population on the base, as well as civilian police force that I was the one in charge of kind of coordinating all of that. Um, we did have one incident while I was there where we did have an active shooter situation and had to, uh, my Marines did a great job. They cordoned off the area. We were able to get the civilians and the off-duty Marines out of the way. And I was able to interact with the military police and the civilian police who eventually took over the scene. Um, ended up being nothing. We didn't find anybody, but we had a lot of combat veterans there that heard a couple popping sounds and they were able to react very well. Um, as far as other Homeland Security um, experience, it's mostly been through my classroom work at Campbell, uh, but I did have concentrations in critical infrastructure as well as um, emergency management and Homeland Security um, administration and working with public officials and the public. So it's actually one of my long-term or mid-term goals is to get a more community outreach for the civilian population um, for the, the one thing predictable about mother nature is that she's unpredictable in the climate of today and this is not to put you on the spot but how secure do you feel like that north carolina is as a whole when it comes to security from a range of potential uh, I think the biggest threat that we face right now, and I've actually seen this in North Carolina, I'm trying to remember the exact name of the town, but we've had, I think it was a municipality or a county that actually suffered a cyber security attack that uh, their systems were locked out and they had some ransomware. So that's happened around the country. Um, North Carolina, because of its military, all the military bases and military presence, would say there is always a threat there, but from personal experience, um, the security on military bases is usually usually pretty good. They don't they don't mess around with that type of stuff. Um, well, and, and I think we all feel like the military bases themselves are secure. Yeah. I was talking about small municipalities, outlying areas, uh, with those with, yes. our, with our civilian population, not necessarily the military population. Yes, with the civilian population, um, as far as like, terrorist attacks and stuff. Um, I mean, everywhere's a threat that so you have the high population, high population centers are um, always a threat, soft targets, anybody want to try to make a, to get their 15 minutes of fame or if it's a coordinated terrorist attack, could do that. Um, outlying areas with all the farmland, especially here in eastern North Carolina, um, there has been um, one class I took, we did a course of study on threats to agriculture and what would happen if low flying plane with a crop duster could dust a, um, could dust farmlands, water supplies. Um, we played what-if scenarios. Like I know how I could, like personally, like I know how I could disable Wilmington for a couple of months, and it wouldn't be that hard. So, critical infrastructure is definitely something that needs to be a priority um, because if that if that critical infrastructure bridges roads and also to include uh, emergency services and their ability to respond, if that gets degraded, then yes, the the uh, the threat definitely goes up. Thank you, yes, sir. And you'll see a lot of air. Yes. So I hope look forward to 
working with all of you. I know this is going to be an ongoing, um, ongoing process, and definitely going to need permission from the board to, for several things that I already have ideas for um, to get additional resources for the county. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Here. Um, Next, uh, uh, one of the things I mentioned at our last meeting is that we should have uh, steel going up at our Park East Shell Building, and Mark Pope is here as well. He's in the back, but but we did want to show the public that there is steel going up at our Shell Building. So uh, uh, these are the uh, pictures at Park East on Lot Eight. We've been through a lot of struggles to get there. We have been through a lot of struggles to get to this point. And uh, I appreciate the work that Mark has done. I appreciate the work. We've had a lot of wetlands issues. Chip's done a great job in dealing with the wetlands issues. So we're, we're getting there. So I uh, did want to let you know that it is up and the public know that we do have walls. Hopefully things will go much quicker now, um, now that we're getting the framework in. Um, Next one I have is uh, our last EMS station, uh, the Miller's Chapel Road one, uh, the Wilson station. Uh, we appreciate the Wilson's donating the property. Uh, right now we have the grand opening scheduled for September 13th at 10 a.m. And uh, last thing I did want to mention is uh, I really want to give a huge shout out to our Maxwell Center staff. Uh, especially for the work that they did at the Purple Heart Banquet over the weekend. We had over 500 attendees at the Purple Heart Banquet. Uh, it was done well. Uh, Public Affairs did an incredible job covering it. It really worked out well, and um, it was an event that all of Wayne County, and especially the Board of Commissioners, would be proud of is uh, how that was handled and operated in the Thanks that we showed our uh, citizens who served and who were awarded the Purple Heart. So it really was a great event. So I just wanted to, to thank uh, Commissioner Pape was there, Commissioner Aycock was there. Uh, so I really want to thank y'all for attending as well. And that is all I have. Commissioner Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have, I don't have my activities that I've been involved with in particular order, but I did uh, take the tour with several other commissioners of the Meadow Lane School and very much more knowledgeable about the situation that the school board uh, is in as far as uh, issues like with Edgewood or whatever. I will say this, I was, with him. I was impressed with that school, the quality of that school and the innovation that were that was put into that school, the thought uh, to 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 be a, a better service to students, parents, and teachers, I was impressed. Um, I think it's one of our better built schools that we've done as a commission board. Uh, we also had a social services uh, board meeting and. Uh, I guess uh, DSS, you can pretty well say it's a, like a revolving door. It doesn't make any difference. Um, what you do as far as pay or anything else, you have a certain amount of turnover in, in DSS. And of course we do across the county. But uh, we are making a lot of uh, progress in our social services department. There are changes that have been made. Uh, we're in better shape now overall in DSS, uh, not only in the services we provide, but in the organization and cooperation within the agency than, than the five years I've been at DSS on the board. So um, I'm really pleased with that. The other thing I was able to attend was uh, attended uh, the meeting at Eureka with the LGC um, having to do with the Eureka Town Charter in, in relation to water and sewer issues. And there's a lot of questions asked, but the LGC has got their plan together. 
they're going to take care of that situation. And I think one of the mis one of the misunderstandings was that I saw by the citizens is that there were some questions asked by the citizens. Well, you know, if you put <clears throat> if the LGC and the state puts two three million dollars in the repair of this sewer system, how are we going to pay it back? And, and they, you know, the LGC had to explain this. This is this is state money. You don't have to pay it back. Once we get everything up and running and everything's approved, then you've got to come up with a way to maintain it. So there was a lot of misunderstanding as far as citizens were concerned about that one question. Um, I also attended the facilities uh, committee meeting uh, this week, and uh, the facilities has a lot on the plate to consider. Uh, I, I was thoroughly um, informed at that meeting. Lastly, last but not least, I want to say a word about uh, Geraldine Lee. When I first came on the DSS board, uh, and, and Commissioner Pate was on the board at that time, DSS board, we asked the that our HR at DSS and the HR at the county start being more communicative with each other. In other words, work together more. And I can tell you, Geraldine Lee stepped up to the plate. She has been attending our DSS meetings. She has been heavily involved in training at DSS. She, you know, we we have we have a great. Uh, HR that's coming up, and we, we're looking forward. We got the same thing coming up. Uh, with, but the key is, is that Geraldine, with her experience, I have never dealt with very many people in my career that were so professional. She's a professional person, and when you know that and you sense that, there seems to be a calmness that she puts into people's heart and mind when she talks to you that she just easy to talk to. So I just want to give a shout out to, to Geraldine that, hey, you know, I, I wish her and her family, her husband well on their uh, retirement, but um, I keep asking her, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to have your allotted time off and then turn around and come back, you know, part time or whatever? We don't know. Just depending on what she wants to do. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I get into the, the places that I have done officially, uh, I would just want to uh, take care of one thing where my wife is concerned. August the 6th is our 47th anniversary. So we've, uh, she's been in charge of me for the last 47 years. That's what I figured I better try to get that in. I uh, almost missed it yesterday in church, but caught myself just in time. But I thought I'd say that. So whenever she's watching this, and I won't say it until she is watching it, she might just see it. Uh, I also, along with Mr. Mayo and uh, Mr. Daughtry, uh, Mr. Acock, attended uh, a tour with the school system. And first, I would like to thank uh, our county manager uh, for taking the lead and making sure that we uh, got there. It was so very important that uh, we were able to take that tour and see for ourselves what the facilities looked like and then hear the school folk give an explanation as to why they are doing what they are doing. Uh, my first opportunity to visit uh, Edgewood was 1986. I uh, came to Goldsboro City to work, and that was one of the sites that uh, was under the, uh, my edge of my umbrella because vocationally, we needed to give all students an opportunity to experience what they were capable of experiencing. I put it like that. So we had a presence there. The building was always kept very neat at that time, as it still is. And on to Meadow Lane. I found it very interesting. The superintendent did give us a pretty thorough uh, explanation of the contact that they have made with the parents 
to share with them what the school system is able to provide for them. And I would ask any of my fellow touring persons to hop in and correct me if I'm wrong. But it sounds like that uh, the population is going to be divided between those two schools. And if I understood him correctly, they would like for all of the elementary students to be at Middle Lane. Is that correct? And it sounds like they're down to either two children or two families that they have not been able to have the right contact to determine where they're going to be at. And I probably need to stop right there because I don't want to be into the school system business and I don't want to make a mistake about the weeds, exactly. But it sounds like that the school system has a plan that they can start the year with and that every child can be served in the safest manner and the most educational manner that they can provide. And, and, and I, I, like I say, my first experience at going to uh, Edgewood was 1986. Uh, I believe our principal at that time was Larry Livingood. And uh, I, one other reason I feel good about what the school system is doing, and I, I probably shouldn't call the name, but uh, the principal at uh, Melda Lane is very creative. Uh, I've worked with her directly over the last uh, 20 some odd years. So I know that she's creative and has a great sense of education and safety at the same time. So uh, I think it's fair to say we need to give the school system an opportunity to open the doors, and uh, I believe it's going to turn out fine. I, along with Mr. Mayo, attended social service, uh, the social service meeting, and uh, that's well under control. And I would like to also thank, I, I believe I should thank the facilities chairperson for uh, given a broader range of the county commissions an opportunity to come to the facilities meeting. Because there's a lot of things taking place yeah. in the facilities meeting, and there's a lot of decisions that's got to be made. We, we talked about the jail, but, uh, you know, and, and it's for the public. The school system is on the agenda for what they want. The Department of Health is on the agenda for what they want. We haven't physically moved DSS to the site that they need to go to. So uh, the public needs to know that there's a lot on our plate that's going to cost money. There's no way to get around it. Uh, I know we've talked about a property tax increase, and we've talked about a sales tax opportunity. It's going to take one of those to do all these things. So I, I, there's no need of beating around the bush. I just thought we'd raise that back up. I will conclude by making a comment about uh, the horrible situation that has taken place over the last three or four days with El Paso and Dayton. Uh, we have arrived in this nation to a place where Sheriff, sure, I'm just a little bit skittish there's no other way for me to see it. It's in your ballpark. I, I, I grow skittish, that's an old country word, that uh, about people that you come in contact with and then people that you don't come in contact with. It's a little bit disturbing that I've heard people who, uh, that I come in contact with on some basis that brags about having the AR-15s, rapid fire magnet things that can kill a lot of people. I don't own one. I don't own one. But it's some dread out there on my part that uh, it sounds like they're just about everywhere. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about category of young men that we've got to know over the last two or three days. I am also talking about 
things that happen throughout our neighborhoods, because I'm not leaving anybody out. Uh, I have had conversations over the last two or three days about some things that has happened in our local neighborhoods that sounds like those same kind of weapons are nearby and being used in things that can happen in our neighborhoods. Uh, we turn the television on in the morning time, and I guess it's good that there's no reporter in Wayne County to be talking about the little things that happen because right this minute we think all of them are happening in Durham and Fayetteville and Raleigh. And, and there's not a night, a day goes by that we don't wake up the next morning and there's been a stabbing, a shooting, a drive-by. And we didn't have to wait until this weekend to know that a, a two-year-old baby got killed. There have been two or three-year-old babies shot in North Carolina. Mr. Sure, that's just disturbing. I would not sit on this and not just say it out loud to bring it to the attention of our public and to say that we have got to do something about this. And the leadership needs to be nationwide, not, not town by town. The leadership needs to be nationwide. And uh, if we believe what we pray to, I don't want to see something happen that our first responders that we are so proud of happen upon a situation and lose their lives trying to save lives. Thank you. Mr. Daughter. I too uh, toured uh, the new metal lane and I've got to give a big shout out to the Board of Education. They did a, a superb job there. But one of the things I want to share with our board and with the public is they, they have at least understood that we have an issue on elementary classroom size with the new law. And they have oversized the classrooms at Meadow Lane that can accommodate 38 children in each classroom with the two teachers. If you recall, that was an option. The option was either reduce the classroom size to 18, I'm gonna use the term 18, uh, or you could in fact have a larger classroom to accommodate up to 38 with two teachers. Uh, they've done that at that school. The other thing that was impressive, I criticized, I think publicly even, I may have said publicly, I criticized the school board about the generator. <laughs> now we can argue over what the price of that generator was, but at any rate, uh, the generator. The foresight in regards to having Metal Lane with a generator that can accommodate it as a shelter during a, a disaster. Um, which also has got their uh, cafeteria facilities to where they're, they're mobile. They can actually produce those uh, meals at that cafeteria and actually take that to another location. Um, they have given a great deal of thought, not only of the usage of the facility, but also uh, in emergency usage as well. Um, so I got to give a shout out to them. They've did a, a good job. Would I've done some things differently? Probably so, but <laughs> we all have our opinions on things. Um, but it looks like that's going to be opening very shortly. And uh, one last thing, and that is, as I was touring the facility, I suppose the real thing that was pointed to me was the, the children in other facilities that are in disrepair that have really aged and the need in our county and all other counties of providing better facilities for our school children. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Bell. Mr. Chairman, I've been, out, <clears throat> been on the sick list for the past three weeks, so I didn't attend any meetings, but I would like to uh, well, the paper that I passed out to you all, I'm not going to ask for approval today. I just want you to look at it. Mr. Mayo stated that we don't get information from the state uh, as to what's coming down until they tell us what we got to pay. So uh, 
But if we form this committee, probation people can keep us informed as to what's coming down ahead of time, and we will know, and we can maybe challenge some of it in, in some way. But uh, the committee that I wanted to put together, I'm just going to read the names off real quick. Uh, the county manager or the uh, assistant county manager, Mr. Parker or Andrew, two commissioners, uh, two chief PPOs from probation and parole, uh, Sheriff Pierce, Major Thaxton, uh, one city police officer, uh, the day reporting center, and somebody from the district attorney's office. And that way we can kind of uh, not make any kind of rules, but just get informed as to what's going on and what's coming down by statute because the state going to send down a statute. They're not just going to uh, ask you if you can participate or want to participate. They're going to write up a statute and send it down to you and tell you what to do. So uh, we can just do this in September, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Aikon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I attended several events, but they've already been mentioned, so I'm not going to mention them again, other than the Purple Heart Banquet. Uh, uh, that's, it, when, when you go to an event like that and see those veterans and men and women uh, that have sacrificed so much for us, uh, some of them was wounded in Korea, Vietnam, in uh, the Middle East, uh, they don't. They don't get over it. They, they you know, they, they're still showing signs of what they sacrificed for us, and uh, it, it just it's it's uh, give you goosebumps when you go to a, a, cer a ceremony like that, or they were well deserving. And I thought, you know, it's, it's ironic uh, when you got serious radio on a vehicle, you never know what channel you're gonna punch in on or what you're gonna hear. But uh, the day before. Uh, the Purple Heart event. How in the world I ended up on the Grand Ole Opry? I don't know on my, on the channel, but uh, and uh, and they had and they and uh, of all people, uh, Charlie Daniels was was a program on him, and he made a statement that uh, that all of us need to really uh, pay attention to. There's two reasons why we've got the freedom that we've got today. That's God Almighty and our men and women in uniform. And that's, 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 that's big. Uh, and that's all I have. What, well, one more thing. Uh, but it's not knowing what's going on in Raleigh. Our clerk sends us a daily bulletin every day. Uh, it's very time consuming to read. And do I read it all? No. But, uh, but thank you for letting us know what's going on in Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Payton. Thank you. I've been working a very limited schedule, and I've been absent from a, a lot of different meetings because of my health. Um, sometime in the, in the end of um, September, I will be going back to Rex for another back tune-up, so I'll be out another four or five weeks. So it's just been a real struggle for me. Um, but I did make it to the Purple Heart Mac. I couldn't stay the whole time because I felt hurt and had to leave. Anyway. The part that I did see was really nice, and I want to thank Bill Broadway for reading the proclamation for the city and the county. And I understand the colonel did an outstanding job, outstanding job. It was interesting yesterday, and I happened to notice I had, I was, believe it or not, I was at the Nahana Pork Center, and I looked at my back tire, and there was a screw in it. So I said, I got to get that fixed today. So I'm over at Precision Tune getting it patched, and this is older um, gentleman sitting there to the right of me. And I looked and I said, he looks familiar. And he had a Purple Heart hat on. So I introduced myself to him. And we probably sat there and talked 30, 40 minutes. And he was a career in that, too. That's where he got his Purple Heart. And he had been there Saturday night. I knew I'd seen that guy somewhere before. But he was very proud of it. And he really, and along with other veterans, saw that that's just a great event. And they really appreciate it that we do that. And hope we can continue to do that from year to year. So anyhow, having said all that, I'm doing what I can to attend the meetings that I, that I can physically get to, but I can't stay gone too far. i got a nurse coming to the house three days a week to change my dressings on my back. So when you get 60 and above, it just goes downhill fast, folks, I'm telling you. you don't know I, don't know, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm going to get there or not. But um, 
and, I, and again, I thank this board for allowing me to do some of the stuff I did by telephone. And I hope that's not something that will reoccur over and over again. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just like to mention one thing. I, I did attend a uh, meeting in Eureka with the LGC, and as I recollect, that's the first meeting or project type in the state of North Carolina. So it's going to set uh, the presence of what's going on with the future. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see how this turns out. Um, that's all I have, and we're to go in closed session for the purpose of. Okay, I have a motion to go in closed. All in favor, please indicate and raise your right hand. 